Hey Ryan, how's it going, bro? Good, thanks to you. Great, thanks, man. Can't complain. Eh? Just a bit cold. <laughs> yeah, oh, flip. Joburg's got ridiculously cold as well. It's I don't know where the temperature dropped to, but man, uh, we got to survive somehow. <laughs> no, crazy. Warm. Jerseys. Pulling out yeah, the we... winter clothes. Need a penny of them. It's not the normal Durban weather anymore. No, no, no. Not anymore. Listen, <laughs> Man, you learn what cold is very quickly. Yeah, definitely, man. Yeah, man, Ryan, I, I want to thank you for taking out the time to um, be on this call on this interview. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's uh, something close to my heart um, to make sure that rugby players prepare themselves for life after rugby as well. Because I know there's a lot, a lot of guys um, who are kind of in the same situation as myself. Um, you believe you're going to become a Springbok rugby player. Uh, yes. You play a professional, but unfortunately, you don't get the breakthrough that you want. And then you come to the age of about 25, 26, um, life hasn't been planned out. Um, you didn't study or anything like that. And then it's like, okay, what, what now? And the sad thing is there's a lot of um, players, especially um, my age, who has fallen out of the system. But not just out of the system, but have lost life completely. Um, busy with wrong things and um, just on a completely different path on what they're supposed to be. So I really want to create that awareness to make sure that um, all rugby players need to make sure that I know there is systems in place, but the people have to be willing to reach out to these um, organizations if they struggle with mental health or if they struggle with whatever. I know there is systems in place to, to help these kind of players, but um, I think we just need to create that awareness a bit more to make sure to create that safe environment so that the, the player doesn't feel ashamed to reach out for, for that kind of help. But um, yeah, but before I carry on, um, if you can just tell the viewers a little bit more about uh, who is Ryan Kinkowski, where does he come from, and um, why is he called the Hoff? <laughs> um, yeah, well, okay, I'm, I'm Ryan Kinkowski. Uh, played at the Sharks for 12, 13, 14 years. Um, ended up going to Japan for six years after that. Um, you know, represented South Africa um, 15s and 7s. Um, you know, growing up, obviously started at Queen's College in Queenstown, junior, and then senior school, I went to St. Andrews College in Grahamstown. So, you know, I was very fortunate to be um, picked by Hans Scriba at St. Stephen's Rugby Festival you know, during one of our tours and he invited me to come to the Sharks Academy. And, you know, two years later, you know, things changed very quickly. You know, I got a chance and I promise you, within a year, you know, your life changes very quickly. So, yeah, just quite a exciting time and just very fortunate that, you know, I was able to, you know, to get what I got from rugby. You know, it's given me everything and I really appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. And I, I want to honor Hans Kriva and them um, at the Sharks Academy. I know they were doing phenomenal work. They, the, the group of players that were coming through the ranks at that period of time and um, just before I went there for a little bit as well, it was just on, a, on another level. The competition with the club rugby wise i think that's actually also a sad topic to see that club rugby is not exactly what it used to used to be um i mean i can remember when you um run on the pitch you might run against um someone who has played curry cup or super rugby before the structures are in place and it's just uh something completely um different but um in in this um career this um the journey that you had what was the, the pinnacle for you that you felt? Because, I mean, you basically achieved everything that uh, a South African rugby player could have wanted. Um, I mean, playing for South Africa, playing Super Rugby, playing for the Blitz Box, um, going overseas as well. What is the main thing that has really stood out for you? Um, it's how quickly it all happens. You know, um, you see so many people, you know, come in. Everyone has the same dream. You know, every rugby player has the same dream. They want to make it, want to make it. Um, yeah. And it's it's such a small percentage of people that actually does make it, you know. Um, and you know, a coach can decide. You know, you can. Yeah, you, know, uh, you know, as an eighth man, you get like ten different eighth men that come through every year. You know, just yeah. through the academy alone, and then the next year there's another eight, or ten. And the next year, and then people don't realize. You know the the amount of hard work that kind of has to go in. The right coach has to kind of back you. So it's not that you're not good enough. You know, it's just that you're not in the right place at the right time. So um, I think as rugby player, you know, a lot of luck comes into that first little bit. 
you know, of getting selected, you know, and then, you know, you obviously have to put in the hard work beforehand. You know, if you're not ready for that little opportunity you get, then, you know, it doesn't happen. You know, you're just not ready. Then the next guy gets a chance. And I think that's what a lot of players um, don't realize. In South Africa, there's so many rugby players that, you know, that yeah. come through and, you know, the amount of, I wouldn't say luck, but, you know, you've got to be prepared for that chance. And, you know, when it comes, you need to be able to take it with both hands and, you know, give it yeah. a good a good go. Definitely. I think when you, when you look at players, uh, when everyone comes together and they ask, okay, who plays prop, who plays lock, and no, then they say, lose forward, everyone raises their hands. Yes. It's, Crazy. It's, it's really at the Sharks Academy, there are so many people. Um, and it's quite funny. You'll see guys like, one year you'll get like five Lucys or six Lucys that have all represented, you know, South Africa in the 19th at Rock of Sharks. And they think they've made it, you know. You can see how they walk around and, you know, they think they've, they're the pinnacle. But then the next year there's another three or four that rock up. And then the next year there's another three or four that rock up, you know. And if you don't work, you know, cool, you've been given a chance, you know, to, to put your hand up and actually do something. But if you don't, they're like, okay, cool, two years later you're gone, you know. And yeah. then the next guy comes in. So it's not all... You know, fun and games, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of hard work. And, you know, you just got to be ready for that opportunity when it comes. And, and something that I was, I was still in school, I think I was around grade 11. And I was in that main thing, okay, well, um, I'm the man at school. I'm going to become a professional rugby player. And as you say, you walk around with pride and you think, okay, well, you've got everything already sorted. And um, I had a chat, I don't know if you can remember, uh, Sandile Noxmalo, that uh, yes. scrum off at the Sharks. Yes. Yes. And he, something that really stood out for me is he, he told me that, Ivan, life is not, every, like, it's not just about rugby. There's something beyond rugby as well. And for some reason, that just stood, uh, um, that, I don't know why, but that just kind of touched me. I'm like, what does he mean? Because, I mean, rugby is my, my entire life. But then you start realizing there's so much more, um, at hand there's so many people around you that you can still affect so, so many people that you can help along the way so many opportunities that you can create for yourself um, outside rugby um, as well yeah. but for yourself Ryan in, in your career did you have that in mind that you knew okay well rugby is a short period of time um, did you go study um, did you plan on any business opportunities or what did you do during that phase um, you know, I was very fortunate yeah, when I was, yes, yeah, I don't know, maybe when I was 20, um, you know, because it, it happened pretty quickly for me. I was quite lucky or fortunate in that way. Um, in that first year, you know, I went Curry Cup, Super Rugby, Springboks, like it was phenomenal. Um, and, you know, I had a guy, Warren Brits, um, I don't know if you remember me, played at the Sharks. Right. He drove me down, I don't know if you remember where, you know, on Chartwell Drive in Umtlanga, Yes. I remember driving with him down that road and he was like, it was like the weirdest thing. He was like, Ryan, this house here, this rugby player used to own this house. And the next house, he's like, this guy used to own this house. This guy used to own this house. So I was like, you know, I found it quite weird that, you know, you're saying that. And he was like, well, people will come here and they get 20,000 rand a month and then they'll pump that entire 20,000 rand a month into a house. Yeah. You know, it's a cool thing. But you don't realize your rugby career only lasts if you're lucky 10 years. Yeah. You know, and the bond's 20 years, 15, 20 years. So what have you actually done, you know, with your money? You haven't yeah. grown it, you know, end up having to sell the house, having to leave, you know, and he kind of planted that picture, you know, in my mind, like, um, you, know, you need to prepare for after rugby, you know. Um, so he kind of started off, a, you know, that thought, you know, preparing for off track, already when I was like 21, 22, you know, so I was, you know, very fortunate to have a couple of cool mentors, you know, that were telling you the whole time, listen, prepare, prepare, prepare. And, um, you know, it kind of did, you know, it helped me get into, you know, a couple of small properties that I tried to just, you know, keep going, get some other income coming in. And then, you know, going to Japan was, you know, it helped me a lot in that sense. You know, I can get in a few other properties um, with a couple other people and you know that's what set me up for after rugby so you know I was very fortunate I had a couple you know cool things that worked out that I did and 
Ja, ähm, ja, so, ja, I'm quite fortunate in that side. Had a couple of cool yeah. mentors. And um, I know Warren Burtz, um, that guy was a machine, a machine yeah. on another level. Yeah. Yeah. Boy. Yes. But, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, man, I just think, as you say as well, like um, a lot of rugby players, they don't really know how to work with money, especially the youngsters. There's, they don't, they're not really educated or anything like that. And I think the important thing is as well, saving is a very good thing. You need to save up but you need to learn how to grow your money as well. And a sad thing that I've seen happen is, um, or happening and what has happened is that some people come with opportunities to rugby players and they pitch them an idea, but the rugby player um, himself doesn't uh, understand the business opportunity or he doesn't exactly understand what happens. And I've seen so many of them lose money because of um, situations like like this and it's a sad thing to see and i think the most important thing is that rugby players need to be aware to educate themselves as well before actually entering an agreement with um someone else rather try to do it um your, yourself as far as you can i know everything you can't do all at once by yourself but make sure that, that you kind of have um the that, agents that... Are, you know agents are kind of meant to guide you on that side you know um you know, as a rugby player, you kind of come from school in your little bubble. Like, if you know at school, you, you're in a little bubble and you go straight from school into a rugby team and everything's done for you. Your breakfasts are done for you. Your lunches are done for you. Your accommodation, you know, people run around. They organize your car. And then you get given, I remember when I started, it was like three and a half thousand rand. You got a month. Now people are getting like 50, 60, 80,000 rand a month. You don't know who... You're going to come to that kid and say to him, listen, I think you should do this or you know, I think you should invest this. They don't care what you're saying at the moment, you know, unless their parents have have kind of instilled that, you know, life after rugby thing, then it's a bit different. I can't generalize, but a lot of us don't want you to tell them, you know, what to do with their money. So, and that's a sad thing, you know, like you, you, you get into a lot of the unions and don't really look after you after rugby. You know, unless you've got some good relationships within the unions while you're there, you've been there long enough, then they'll still, you know, if you pick up the phone, they'll answer. You know, and I'm, you know, I've got good relationships with mine, but, you know, they don't phone and ask, you know, um, how can we help you after rugby? Um, there's none of that, you know, so if you don't do it for yourself, no one else is going to do it. Definitely, and we definitely need to take control, um, <clears throat> sorry, of our own futures and things like that as well. But it's sometimes you, you kind of have that expectation, well, when your career is finished, you go, so you're still going to be in contact with the boys and, that, and those kind of things. But it's actually sad because I can remember when I stopped playing, it was no one is contacting you anymore, no. not around the guy. And it's no. like it completely changes. You're like, oh, shucks, what, what is going on? It's like, because they go, to, they go to a new team. They, their lives carry on. You know, it's it's, you know, it's crazy. We were so close to the Sharks, and I think there's maybe a handful of people that you actually stay in touch with. You know, and you yeah. all move all the country. You know, because everyone is from. You got a handful from Cape Town, Joburg, Pretoria. You got people from everywhere, and you know, if you're not in the same town, you you really get to see the guys. Um, so it's quite sad. You know, they're your family. They're everything for that little small moments in time but yeah you know once it's over it's gone yeah definitely and i mean you guys were quite a special group i can remember from around 2007 i've been watching a few videos and editing a few of them as well yeah. um man that i think that group in 2007 and um the entire super 14 rugby structure was just it was really awesome and for south africa as well um a really great um, year of rugby but um, I want to take you back um, uh, you've probably seen some of the videos um, to that game versus the Crusaders um, Odwa firstly dropping the ball <laughs> and then scoring the winning try what was yeah. going in what was going in your guys minds that last passages of play because I mean there was a moment where the Sharks got the penalty um, you guys couldn't kick out and then you lost the ball the Crusaders lost the ball again and you guys just went and score. Like what? what it's, all guys a, it's all a blur. I promise you it was, it was massive because they were like unbeatable back then. You know, no one beat them. 
you know, back then. Um, I still remember that one where Ordway dropped it because we've been practicing a move off yeah. the back, like a little back pass, and you know, it worked perfectly. Like, you know, like everything worked perfectly, and then he just dropped the ball, you know. So I think it was quite awesome that he ended up scoring the winning try at the end. Um, yeah. one points. Um, no, it was, you actually don't know what to think. I promise you, it's like you just you hold your breath to hope that yeah. everything. You know, it works out. Um, and then when that kick came, Ruan just stepped up and said, he's kicking. You know, no one sure. said anything. He put his hand up. He said, I'm kicking. Took it, slotted it straight through the middle. Um, yeah, it was magical. You know, it was, yeah, our team, we did some really cool things um, with that bunch of players. And yeah, I was just very happy to be a part of it. Yeah. And it, <clears throat> it was quite crazy because I can remember still watching that game live. And that's probably the game that really inspired me most out of all the games. I've been looking for this game over and over. And um, I can remember still my brother. It was like 80 minutes and he's like, no, man, the Sharks aren't going to win. I must put it off the TV. And like, the whistle hasn't blown. I'm like, the whistle hasn't blown yet. And the Crusaders have, I'm like, the whistle hasn't blown yet. And there you guys went and you... Um, went and go, and go score the the try. And I think it's actually quite a very good life lesson to sometimes you might feel, okay, well, uh, things aren't working out. You down in your own half um, with literally one opportunity. If you lo knock the ball, um, it's game over for you. But there's still hope. And I think in this lockdown as well, um, it's very important to stay focused. I mean, like you guys stayed focused in that game in that moment. Is just to stay focused and to support one another because if if we're going to work with teamwork during these times, I think there's a massive difference that we can um, make in this country to make sure that lives are sorted and uh, people have a future. But um, yeah, for yourself, um, Ryan, in this um, lockdown, have you been exercising a bit? What is what is your normal routine? First <laughs> six weeks, I trained every day. You know, um, I'm in a small apartment, so it's been quite tough. Um, yeah. So you went outside. So, you know, I trained every day, trying to eat healthy, did everything. But then when they extended it and they kept going, I've been like, it's been tough. You know, to stay motivated. All I want to do is just get outside and be able to, you know, just go to a gym or, um, yeah, that's probably the most I miss. Um, and you, you find you, you actually eat more. You eat way more when you're sitting here at home. Definitely. Just you always get up, you're checking the fridge. I probably have 20 cups of coffee a day. It's yeah, um, I'm just happy that Monday was the first, they're going to relax a few things so people kind of you know get going. Um, so yeah, I just want to get outdoors a bit more and you know get out because it's yeah, you know, being locked down is quite crazy, it's tough, yeah, and I, and I think as well for a lot of people. Um, it's tough, especially when you are surrounded with um, the same people yes. or you um, have the same conversations and things like that. Mm -hmm. there's, not, there's not really new news. It's just the same thing over and over and over again. And I've been trying to ignore the news for a bit just to um, yes. stay, stay sane for a, yeah, for a bit. Yeah, things happening. It's a... Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, there's always a positive outcome. But... Um, yeah, man. So coming to the last part of the interview, um, if you can just um, share with the guys, if you're busy with some business or whatever, where the people can reach out to that, um, if there's projects or anything that you're busy with, and just some hope and word of encouragement for the for the viewers out there. Um, you know, you know encouragement. You know, Business-wise, it's more private property stuff I've got into, so nothing quite out in the public yet. Um, we were a cool... Um, charity that we've been working with but that I'll launch um, still finalizing a couple of things because okay. we, we are doing really well and then we got shut down um, so it was yeah you can't really do anything without everything being signed and done properly um, but yeah on the positive side you know if, you know things will always get better you know the sun will rise tomorrow it will you know keep your head up um, yeah you know you know Family's always there, you know, friends always there, pick up the phone, you know, how easy is this, you know, they have a chat. Everyone's Zooming these days, I've seen more friends, you know, on Zoom and chatting like this than ever before, you know, so it's, the technology's there just to, you know, get in touch. If you have a problem, 
you know, pick up the phone, message. Yeah. You know, um, I know there are many rugby players, if you actually had to reach out to them, they will, they will get in touch, you know, when they have time. Um, so if anyone you know, has a problem, you know, you need someone to chat to, get in touch, you know. Um, there's always someone that's willing to listen and, you know, try and help out where they can. Yeah, awesome, man. And uh, yeah, Ryan, I just want to thank you for taking out the time to be um, on this interview. And yeah, man, I just want to thank you for the person that you are um, on the rugby pitch as a leading by example and off the pitch now as well, just going and inspiring people with, with actions. I think it's a very important thing that we need to keep on inspiring people with actions and not always um, just talk. And you're a great example for that. And um, yeah, I just want to encourage all rugby players as well, guys. Um, stay strong. doesn't matter what um, happens. Make sure you reach out to someone. Make uh, sure you get yourself a mentor and someone that you can look up to and uh, that can...